Well, good afternoon and welcome to uh, today's Senate Occasional Lecturer. I'm Jackie Morris, the Clerk Assistant Procedure um, in the uh, Department of the Senate. I feel like I introduce myself to you all each time we have one of these, but hello again. In welcoming you, I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, who are the traditional owners of the land that we meet on today, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Our speaker, um, Dr. David Karp, comes to us from George Washington University in Washington, DC, where he's an associate professor and associate director of the School of Media and Public Affairs. The school advertises that it excels at bringing Washington into the classroom. And I'm surmising that perhaps today's lecture will bring a little bit of Washington to Canberra. Dr. Karp's research explores the impact of the internet on politics and political associations. As well as teaching and writing, I understand that Dr. Karp is an avid reader of WIRED, which is a monthly magazine about how technology will affect politics, culture and economics. Late last year, the magazine published his impressive analysis of 25 years of its own predictions of what the digital future would look like. I won't spoil today's lecture um, for you, but the results of that work, and I, I read that last night, are quite fascinating. Dr. Karp has travelled to Canberra as a distinguished visitor of the University of Canberra. He was a keynote speaker at the Australia and New Zealand Communication Association Conference, which is still on at the Museum of Australian Democracy as we speak. And I would ask you to welcome me in joining him to today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here. Um, so I want to speak with you all today mostly about findings that came out of that article that you just heard about. Um, last summer, I spent the entire summer reading Wired magazine chronologically in order to trace the history of the digital revolution. Uh, and that's because having studied digital politics now for about 15 years, what I've noticed is that we often have an image in our heads of how the internet is about to change society in the near term, in five years, 10 years off. And some of those predictions change over time. Certainly, the world we live in today is quite different than the world we lived in 20 or 25 years ago. But some of those predictions stay anchored in time. In 1993, it was predicted that the New York Times and the mainstream media would be fossilized, dead and gone, within five years. That same prediction was there five years later, 10 years later, and is still with us today. And I think there's a lot that we can learn by looking back at the digital revolution and seeing what predictions we make and what we can learn from the, the similar mistakes that we have made time and time again. So let me start by explaining what I mean by internet time. Uh, this is a, a, a commonality within Silicon Valley speak, but I'm not sure if it travels abroad. Um, a scholar named Barry Wellman said in 2001, an internet year is like a dog year, changing seven times faster than normal human time. Uh, this is partially because of what's called Moore's Law, which was uh, technologist Gordon Moore's prediction over 50 years ago now that the number of transistors that you could uh, put on a silicone chip would double every year and a half or two years. And what that would mean is that computing would keep on getting both cheaper and faster. In practice, for us with the internet today, what internet time means is that the internet of 2019 is in some fundamental ways different from the internet of 2014 or 2009, 2004, 1999. I first noticed this at a conference about 11 years ago now where we were discussing uh, YouTube in the 2008 American election. Uh, and as we were discussing this, I pointed out to my fellow scholars you know, we're all studying YouTube in this election. Nobody is studying YouTube in the 2004 election. Why is that? And there was sort of an awkward hush that fell over the, uh, over the group. And then I revealed the punchline. Well, it's because YouTube didn't exist in 2004. It hadn't been invented at that election. The pace of online change means that we are constantly catching up with this new digital revolution and imagining, well, what will this mean for us? What will Bitcoin mean for politics? Or what will virtual reality mean for politics? The internet of things. And as we try to adapt to this changing media environment, again, we keep on making some of the same predictions time and time again. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. So again, last summer, I sat down with these copies of Wired Magazine over the course of six weeks. I traveled through digital history and tried to get a sense of 
our image of the digital future and how it has and has not changed through Wired Magazine, which is sort of the archetypical magazine, at least in the United States and Silicon Valley, for imagining what the digital future is about to be. Um, that was published in Wired itself in their 25th anniversary issue. Uh, you are welcome to go find the article online if you'd like to after this talk. Um, but in it, I discussed these predictions and some of the mistakes that we repeatedly make along the, over the years. One point that stuck out for me, and I've spent the past year just constantly pondering, is a, a bet that executive editor Kevin Kelly made in 1995. This was in an interview with a, a neo-Luddite um, who was a critic of technology in the 1990s, and so Wired Magazine didn't like them. His name is Kirkpatrick Sale. And Kevin Kelly had this uh, interview with Sale, which was more of a fight than an interview. And towards the end of the interview, Kevin Kelly gets, gets very heated and says, so you have multinational global currency collapse, social friction and warfare, both between the rich and the poor and within nations. You have continent-wide environmental disasters causing death and great migrations of people. All by the year 2020, yes? How certain are you about all this, what you call your optimism? These were predictions that Sale was making in his book in 1995. Kirkpatrick Sale says, well, I've spent the last 20 years looking into these problems. I suggested to my daughters who are in their 20s that it would be a mistake to have children. It is quite dour, quite dire. Kelly says, would you be willing to bet on your view? Sale, sure. Okay. Kelly pulls out a checkbook and bets him $1,000 that by the year 2020, we're not even close to these disasters, a convergence of global currency collapse, warfare or tensions between the rich and poor, and environmental disasters of significant size. And they bet $1,000 that by 2020, we wouldn't be anywhere close to those three disasters. And the question I found myself pondering, the question that I'll pose to this audience, 2020 is now very close. Which of them do you think should win that bet? For the magazine, I then reached out to Kevin Kelly, who still writes for Wired Magazine. I come out of the environmental movement. I, looking at the, looking at the headlines, thought, it's pretty obvious that while we haven't reached these full disasters, currency manipulation looks worse now than it did in 1995. Tensions between the rich and poor, growing inequality, clearly has gotten worse. Environmental disasters, like in Puerto Rico, those are getting greater. In fact, all of these have been covered in Wired Magazine in the recent years that I found in my study. So I reached out to Kevin Kelly and I asked him about it. He wrote back right away. In 2015, I tried to find Kirk Sale to see if he wanted to double up on the bet. I didn't find him easily and I didn't want to rub his nose in it since he is obviously losing. He goes on from there. Now, I don't want to turn this talk into me explaining why I disagree with Kevin Kelly, but what I do want to point out is that for those of us who don't spend time reflecting on our predictions from 25 years ago, we don't think about how we thought society was going to change with the internet. That means that we never then update our expectations. Certainly in environmental disasters, we're worse off than we were 25 years ago. There are more extreme weather events now than, the, the, than there were then. But if we don't look back on what we thought was going to happen, then we can't improve our predictions today. Another example that particularly stood out for me was an article by Tom Dow. This was published in January 1997, titled News You Can Abuse. And Tom Dow, in this article, coins a term, para-news. Uh, and para-news, he says, is fake rumors that are spread online that are too good to check. His article is about uh, fake news that is spread about candidate Clinton in the US election that people find, they share, and it's untrue, but it's too good to check. And reading this, I thought to myself, <laughs> this sounds an awful lot like the 2016 election, where we also, scholars like myself, have spent so much time talking about the fake news industries that rose up and had so much discussion of stories that were patently untrue about candidate Clinton. So what is the difference, really, between the para-news of 1996 election and the fake news industry that we saw in 2016? Is there nothing new at all? Tom Dow has two quotes in this article that really stand out for me. The first is he says, when the barriers come down, when people cease to trust the authorities, they, some of them anyway, become at once more skeptical and more credulous. These words are, just, are, are clearly more true today than they were 20 years ago. 
They could be transported from this article to an article in Wired or any other public-facing magazine 20 years later smoothly. There's a second quote in there from Esther Dyson. The net is terrible at propaganda, but it's wonderful at conspiracy. That, not so much. The net, it seems today, is better at propaganda than it was 20 years ago. So that led me to think about how the internet has changed through internet time over 20 years. And a few things immediately become apparent. Um, this is an example from 20 years ago, or from 2017 in Wired Magazine, where they're discussing the fake news factories in Macedonia. These were, for those of you who haven't heard about this, uh, a set of Macedonian teens realized that there was an awful lot of money to be made by manu manufacturing fake, uh, websites of fake newspapers, producing stories that were untrue, but easily clickable, easily shareable, buying cheap Facebook ads, and then all the people who visited it produced tens of thousands of dollars in revenue in sidebar advertising for them. A bunch of Macedonian teens in the town of Velez were getting rich through the election through fake news. And that seems clearly different than the para news of uh, 1996. So the differences here, I think, are a change in the mechanisms of diffusion and the political economy of disinformation. By mechanisms of diffusion, the internet of 1996 was an internet of static web pages. It was an internet of chat rooms where you could reach out to a few dozen people in an AOL chat room and email forwarding chains. If you wanted to spread fake rumors about Bill Clinton in 1996, these were the tools that you had available to you. You could create a website and hope that people visited it. People in the pre-Google age somehow found it and visited it. Um, you could log on to chat rooms with a few dozen people and say, hey, did you hear that Bill Clinton has syphilis? People tried that in 1996. That was a way of spreading fake news. And everyone has an uncle who forwards uh, emails that are untrue, and eventually you learn to discount that, uh, that uncle. So what we have here is greater friction in 1996 that slows down the spread of these rumors, slower speed as a result, and also easier traceability. Those email forwarding chains, well, you can see who forwarded it from who. That's patently different from the internet of 2016 and the town of Velez, where by being able to spread all of this news through social media, they were able to uh, manufacture news that would travel fast with very little friction, be difficult to track because you can't tell who it came from. Uh, it's their advertisers and it's hard to trace that through. We saw for, what, almost a year after the election, people still trying to figure out the scale, the magnitude of fake news being shared in the 2016 election. Uh, and all of that creates a different problem than we had before. The second, then, is the political economy of disinformation. It's worth noting that the fake news of the 1990s was a hobby. You couldn't really make money off of it. If you had a hobby of setting up a website that would have fake rumors about Bill Clinton or Bob Dole, yeah, you could do that. No one would be able to stop you very well. But it couldn't travel very far, and you couldn't make money off of it. In 2016, it had become an industry. So these kids in Macedonia were doing this not because they had a problem with Hillary Clinton, not because they had a political agenda, but because it was a way to make money. And you also had, as has now been well reported, uh, the Internet Research Agency in Russia that was doing this not for profit, but for political gain. So as more people came online, the political economy, the value of running disinformation campaigns increased. The internet changed, and therefore the, this phenomenon, even though it looks so similar across 20 years, changes as well. It's also worth noting the aftermath of that election, though. In 2017 and 2018, Google and Facebook took steps to shut down the types of practices that those Macedonian teens uh, were engaging in. They set you know, simple, rule, simple rule changes that said, if your site is pretending to be a newspaper and is not a newspaper, then you can't get sidebar advertising revenues uh, to you. They just shut down the economics of that. That was a rule change within Google and Facebook. What was happening there that we see increasingly is in the absence of regulators playing a direct role, the platforms themselves end up stepping in and playing an imperfect, uncomfortable, quasi-regulatory role. Google and Facebook are not well situated to make decisions about how our democratic elections should be run. But at least in the United States, where our regulators have been very slow to make those decisions, Google and Facebook then have to step in and fill the gap. 
This also echoes an example that I saw in the journalism through line in Wired Magazine. Uh, in 2009 and 2010, uh, there was a site online called Demand Media. It hosted other sites, uh, one that's pretty well known as Cracked.com. Cracked still exists today, but is no longer part of Demand Media. But this was a moment in time in which the future of journalism looked like Demand Media and Cracked.com. The future of journalism was, as uh, Daniel Roth put it, fast, disposable, and profitable as hell. Uh, it was also clearly a dystopia. The model they had figured out was one in which, by gaming Google's algorithms, they could identify profitable search terms that didn't already have a lot of reputable sources and pay a couple of uh, uh, freelancers a couple dollars to produce a video or produce a listicle, have that appear at the top of those search terms, and then profit as a result. When demand media went public, it went public for uh, about one and a half billion dollars, making it valued more than the New York Times. And if you read Wired Magazine, if you read the history of the digital future, what we were seeing at that time was people looking at this model and thinking, my God, this is what journalism is going to become because this is where the money is. All of journalism is going to be pushed towards the demand media model of low quality videos, low quality stories that are cheap enough that you can turn a profit. And if this is capturing all the ad revenues, then how are we gonna pay for real journalism? Demand media went public, but what was happening along, alongside that is all the criticisms of demand media and all the complaints from Google users who said, yeah, this was the top search term, but this was a terrible video, this was low quality, led Google to adjust the, their algorithms and content farms like demand media never recovered. Content farms still exist today, but they are not the threatening future that they once seemed to be because of technological answers to these problems. So we can either regulate it as regulators or Google and Facebook can step in, change their algorithms in order to deal with these threats. The trajectory of the digital future never ends up being quite what we expect because of those underlying ad models that are shaping what is powerful, what is profitable. But those ad models themselves are so fragile and they change over time. So switching now, a second observation that I wanna share with you today concerns digital propaganda. Um, show of hands, how many of you are familiar with Cambridge Analytica? Most of you, okay, good. So I won't give too much background on them. Uh, after the 2016 election in the United States, this became the major story uh, about propaganda in the election. Um, and the interesting thing to me is that the story about micro-targeting in elections doesn't begin in 2016. It goes back at least till 2004. You can even trace it back to the 1980s before Wired Magazine. In virtually every election, in the aftermath of that election, Stories are written by quite good journalists that are discussing how advances in micro-targeting and advances in the voter file and the ability to track people online are leading a set of digital wizards to manufacture consensus, manufacture support for politicians, and is a threat to democracy. Not quite right now, but in the near future, that it could break democracy by making micro-targeted persuasion just too good. And there are essentially two stories that have emerged about Cambridge Analytica that are in, uh, that are, uh, in tension with one another. One is the story that was originally told by Cambridge Analytica and by some journalists covering them, that Cambridge Analytica had made some startling breakthroughs in psychographic micro-targeting, that along with data on every American citizen, and since they were involved in Brexit, every British citizen as well, uh, along with data on their uh, voting habits and their consumer profiles, they also now had a psychological profile of everyone, and they had fitted a perfect psychological message to each target in the voter universe to either get them to vote or not vote or vote for a different candidate. That they had a set of data wizards. Alexander Nix, the head of Cambridge Analytica, gave a speech where he talked about their massive breakthroughs in psychological model modeling and psychographic targeting. So that's one story that's told about them, is that they had a pile of data illegally obtained by Facebook. They used that to perfectly model the electorate, and that then skewed the electoral result. A second story about Cambridge Analytica says they had a pile of data that they illegally obtained by face from Facebook. They used that in order to sell a bunch of goods and services to the Trump campaign and to a number of other Republican campaigns. However, that model didn't work very well, and what they were actually producing, while they 
broken off a lot of election laws and they don't exist anymore as a result, that what they were producing wasn't all that different from the other micro-targeting that we've seen in elections past. I would suggest to you that that former story, the story of them as digital wizards, has very little evidence. And in fact, through digital history, this is a story that we have told and retold without any data to back it up. This is something that I tracked in, in my previous book, Analytic Activism, that broadly there are two stories that get told about decision making in the era of big data. The first is a story of, di of digital wizardry, that we have a set of data scientists, people who specialize in big data modeling or machine learning, who through their piles of data on every citizen, have now unlocked our psychological profiles, now know us better than we know ourselves. There have been studies that say with seven or 15 uh, Facebook links, they can know us better than we know ourselves. Um, that is a story which again has been told and retold through 25 years. And throughout that 25 years, what has also been promised is, while the data is still pretty messy now, just wait, five years from now when it gets better, that's when terrible things will happen. That's when democracy itself will be at risk because the data scientists, these wizards, know you better than you know yourself. But the other story that gets told about decision making in the era of big data is the story that I saw when I actually went and spoke with data scientists working in advocacy organizations. And this is a story that also comes out of Silicon Valley, but is, I think, more true and more real. It's a story of build, measure, learn cycles in which data scientists are working through the hard, messy work of figuring out what is our organization trying to achieve, how could we measure that, and then using data and experiments to incrementally improve it along the way. People engaging in build, measure, learn cycles can improve the output of organizations. They can help electoral campaigns be more efficient in their voter contact. But it's a difference of degree, not a difference of kind. And it embraces that at, at heart, all of this data is still quite messy, still quite incomplete. What I'd suggest to you, what I wanna posit to you today, is that looking through 25 years of digital history, I think we can maybe conclude that there are no uh, data wizards, that we live in a world without wizards. So in particular, in theory, yes, online advertisements could be a threat to democracy. If the data was good enough, if it was perfect, it is theoretically possible that electoral campaigns could target one message to one audience, another message to another audience, and, and subdivide the country so that they also don't reach out to people who aren't in their target universe. That could be threatening to democracy. But in practice, the data is messy, it is imperfect. And that means that the most sophisticated and threatening applications pretty much never get used. You don't exclude people from your target universe unless you're sure that you shouldn't target them. And since the data is messy and keeps remaining messy, campaigns don't do these most, most of these most threatening things. In terms of psychographics, it's also worth noting, I would posit to you that if there's going to be a breakthrough in psychographic advertising, it will not be in elections, it will be in commerce. I myself will start worrying about psychographic advertising once we see it very clearly used for selling gym memberships. Think about it, gym memberships is a great place to use psychological profiling. You can measure week by week whether or not your advertising produced an uptick in people signing up for a gym membership. And depending on your psychological profile, different messages will clearly convince you to, to sign up for a gym membership that you're then not gonna use and discard six months later and then see another advertisement and sign up again. In elections, the outcome variable that we're tracking isn't something that can get measured week by week. It's just, did people vote, in the US, did they vote on election day? Here, you all have to vote, but also who did they vote for? All the advertising that you're doing up until an election, you can't measure whether it was truly effective until the election happens, and then you have to wait several years to measure it again. So of course, if there is going to be a breakthrough in psychographic advertising, it won't come from politics. It will come in a space where it is easier to measure and refine, to build, measure, learn over time. And yet, I can promise you all here today, as America gears up for a year and a half for the 2020 election, that in January, February, March 2021, there will be major stories in US newspapers and news magazines about the latest breakthroughs in micro-targeting. And they will probably once again discuss psychographics. The reason for that is because the marketers, the people like Alexander Nix at Cambridge Analytica who are selling their products, have an incentive 
to uh, pose as data wizards in order to sell their product. And journalists have an incentive to believe them because it makes for much more compelling stories than a story about build, measure, learn cycles and data scientists working through messy variables and then trying to get their bosses to take their results seriously. So we, the cycle is going to repeat itself ad nauseum. If we look back through history though, we can hopefully potentially start to learn and do better. That said, I, I wanna be clear that digital disinformation does not have to be effective in order to have a substantial political effect. I am not convinced that Cambridge Analytica itself swayed very many votes in the US election, but that does not mean that the use of digital tools and digital propaganda in the election had no impact at all. Um, how many of you have heard of Pizzagate? A handful of you. Um, as someone from the United States, it's embarrassing to me that, those, that you have heard of that. Um, Pizzagate is an embarrassment for the United States. I don't think I'm a partisan in saying that, in fact. Um, Pizzagate is a conspiracy theory that was hatched out of the October 2016 release of John Podesta's emails. He was uh, involved in the Clinton campaign. Uh, they poured through those emails and they constructed an imaginary narrative uh, that said that John Podesta, Hillary Clinton, and the rest of the Democratic elites were involved in a child sex slavery ring holding children in the basement of a pizza place uh, in Washington, D.C. called Comet Ping Pong. There are several problems with this, including the fact that Comet Ping Pong does not have a basement. <laughs> Pizzagate nonetheless continued to spread online even after the election and led to a man showing up at Comet Ping Pong uh, bearing arms with a rifle. He, fi he luckily didn't kill anyone, but what he, but he fired the rifle, I think, into the floor and demanded to be led into the basement so he could free the children. So this disinformation has a clear effect there both in terms of individual actors who take it to be true. How many of you, by the way, have heard of QAnon? Two of you, I'm not gonna tell the rest of you of QAnon because it's embarrassing for the United States and it is still July 4th in the United States right now. <laughs> but if you wanna know about conspiracy theories that are having real purchase in the United States, you can look it up after this talk. Um, but the impacts that it clearly has are not just the, these Pizzagate conspiracy theorists who now hear more about this and get more involved. Um, but it also has a media agenda setting impact. The strategic value of that story in the, in the weeks before the 2016 election were that the release of John Podesta's emails led to mainstream media coverage of yet another email scandal for Hillary Clinton, which took other stories out of the media limelight. So that media agenda setting impact is very real for digital propaganda as a lateral effect. Even if the pro propaganda on Facebook isn't directly changing people's minds, it is reshaping the public conversation uh, in ways that rise some, some stories in the media agenda and therefore the political agenda and lower others. Um, it also has an important uh, role in undermining what I would call a load-bearing democratic myth. There's a load-bearing myth in certainly in American democracy and I imagine in other democracies. It is a myth of the attentive public. The myth of the attentive public, put simply, says that politicians and their campaigns need to be careful that they aren't caught in a lie because if they are caught in a lie, they will be held accountable by a public that will be outraged and, and will take them to account on election day. In the traditional mainstream media system that the US had in the 1960s through early 1990s, this was represented through individual uh, reporters who on TV would be able to call out a lie and the sense amongst public political elites is if that happens, something bad will happen to us and our party in the next election as a result. Now I call that a load-bearing myth because there's very little evidence that that's actually true. If you test that myth, that norm, that we need to not be caught in a lie because bad things will happen, and nothing bad happens, then that norm vanishes, it goes away. And part of what has been happening, at least in the United States for the past 25 years, is a constant testing, pushing against those load-bearing norms to find out when you were caught in a lie and you just ride right through it, does anything happen as a result? And what we've slowly, incrementally been finding amongst our political elites is that you can get away with a lot more than they thought they could get away with. And that makes it that much harder for the two parties to govern together. So I would say that digital disinformation is another example of this that once it becomes clear to political elites, 
that waves of disinformation can lead to contestations of the very nature of what counts as true. That then allows them to exist in different news realities where they are no longer held to account by a mainstream media. By a, uh, they are no longer checked uh, by the media and by the public. So part of the democratic challenge that we now have in governance, at least in the United States, I don't want to speak for parliament here, certainly, but one of the challenges that we have is that these disinformation campaigns, even if they don't have direct effects, have these lateral spillover effects, and they can be quite threatening for us. And there's two other points I want to make, and I want to make sure there's time for questions. So I'll go through, through these uh, a little bit quicker. Um, first, in both the books that I wrote previous to this Wired project, a question that often came up, a question that comes up for all of us digital politics scholars, is the question of what about clicktivism or slacktivism? Let me uh, do a scan of the audience. How many of you have heard those terms before? Virtually all of you, great. So briefly, the, the premise of the clicktivist critique is that by lowering the transaction costs of online engagement, we may cheapen political participation. That when engagement just becomes a retweet or a like or signing a digital petition, that somehow that might mean less and be less valuable. Um, the research literature has largely complete, concluded that the clicktivist or slacktivist cl critique doesn't have a lot behind it. Um, one thing that I, over the years, have often reminded people of is that prior to the digital era where we were concerned about clicktivism, we often complained about armchair activism. Back in the 1970s, the real worry was, are we cheapening activism because now the way people get involved is not going out into the streets, but by making phone calls to Congress and writing letters to Congress. There has always throughout history been a trend of looking at the lowest bar of engagement and saying, well, that, that must be useless. That must be not good enough. And if there's too much of it, there must be something wrong with it. In other research that I've done, what I've found is that if we measure any individual digital tactic, it's very difficult to suss out whether that tactic is powerful or not, because that's actually the wrong frame of reference. We need to look in terms of a broader campaign. So signing a digital petition can be pointless or can be quite powerful if it, is, if it is the first step in a broader campaign of influence. If that digital petition helps to spur a bunch of uh, powerful media coverage, or if it leads to a set of people who then take a next action and a next action and a next action, then it can be quite effective. If it's just a random digital petition, then it won't be effective, but we've always had ineffective campaigning. So the clicktivist or slacktivist critique has largely gone away in the literature, though it does have echoes throughout decades. Uh, particularly in the United States, it's gone away because uh, the, the blessing since Donald Trump has come into office is that we ha now have so much offline activism as well. We now so see pretty deep engagement on both sides now that politics is so front and center for most of my country. Um, but what has happened alongside that is sort of an inversion of that critique. Um, let's get by that. Um, so the thing that we're now being forced to rethink is an old assumption in all of democratic theory about the earnestness of public participation. We have long held as a bedrock truth that participation in politics is by its very nature good. That the people who will show up to political events, the people who will engage, are being earnest in their engagement, and that is how democracy works, is that we want more people to be well-informed and participating. That will lead to better, more just outcomes. That is a fundamental bedrock premise. And what I mean by an inversion of the clicktivist critique is the clicktivist critique said, lowering the transaction costs means that when you engage, it might be meaningless. What we've now started to see mostly since around 2014 in the United States, uh, it started with a, a campaign called Gamergate, um, which I won't get into now, but again, if you're interested, you can search online and read about it for days. Um, but what started to happen around then is we saw people engaging in online politics through trolling, through disinformation, and engaging in bad faith discussion. Um, the women in the room, frankly, probably have seen a lot of this if you engage on social media. Um, people will attack you on social media, uh, not because they genuinely disagree with what you're saying, but because they want to drown out your voice. And in so doing, they will be strategic in their behavior and misrepresent their priors. That's a problem because that, what that ends up meaning is that the answer to bad speech can't just be more speech because since online speech is so cheap, there can always be more bad speech. 
This is the puzzle that we're just now starting to work through as democratic theorists, and I would say as regulators, is this problem of what happens when we can no longer assume that the people who are showing up and making arguments you disagree with genuinely believe those arguments. Back when participation was costly, people who were showing, if, if you showed up to say an event like this, what we could certainly assume is that if you showed up, if you put in that effort, even if you disagree with everything I say, it's a genuine disagreement because you put the time in to do that. Online, now that it is so cheap to engage, we have seen a flourishing of people engaging in bad faith argument and bad faith argumentation is in fact the point. The platforms, or Facebook in particular, are flustered by this because they assume that when people are participating on Facebook, they are showing their true selves. And who are they? Who is Facebook or Google to tell people that they shouldn't be able to voice those complaints, voice those perspectives? But when we stop assuming, assuming earnestness, we see that it's a different problem than it had been before. These images up here, by the way, are by uh, a book and a report by Whitney Phillips, who's the leading scholar in the United States on this. She is the expert, so if you're curious to learn more, I would point you to her work rather than my own. The final point that I want to make then, and I'll pose this as a question, I, I started this talk by mentioning internet time and the rate of change online. The final puzzle that I found in the course of my Wired project, my trip through digital history, was a sense that the pace of internet time the pace of online innovation may be slowing down. And I think that matters in some profound ways for digital politics. So I've constructed just an, an ugly timeline of the digital revolution. These are uh, moments that I saw reading through Wired magazine. The top line is the 1990s through 2010. And you can see the dramatic pace of change. 1993 is the introduction of the Mosaic web browser. That's the start essentially of the mass internet. We then have the Netscape IPO, which is when uh, Silicon Valley realized that there was really quite big money and the rest of the economy realized there was quite big money in the internet. That started the web 1.0 boom. Um, you had the browser wars, the Linux wars, the copyright wars. Throughout all of this, you have these dramatic changes in what it means to be online, what the online experience is. And throughout all of this time, being online was still being tethered to a desktop portal. So you were logging on to the information superhighway. You were online, so you couldn't really be offline. Then in the uh, first decade of the 21st century, we have the dot-com bubble bursting, the rise of web 2.0, the iPod, uh, the rise of Wi-Fi, which meant we were no longer tethered to our desktop portals. We could have laptops. Uh, you had social media rising with the blogosphere. Um, then you have the introduction of iPhone, Facebook, Twitter, social media where now the internet is, uh, uh, the, the difference between online and offline is fully dissolving because all of you right now have the internet in your pocket. In fact, I want to co commend all of you that you aren't looking at the internet throughout this entire talk. Uh, you're much better than most academics that way, actually. Usually in this talk, they're all looking at their phones, including myself. Um, but we see this dramatic change in what it means to be online. But look at that second line there, really starting in 2010 with tablets. Wired Magazine is writing about tablet computing as the next big revolution that's going to change everything. Actually, I remember speaking with my wife about this when I read this article, and uh, I'm going to quote you here to everyone, but uh, when I said this, she said, isn't the iPad just a bigger iPhone? I said, yeah, it's pretty much what tablets have turned out to be. That is a lesser revolution than we saw in those first 15 years. That's then followed by 3D printing, which may one day be revolutionary, but they were writing about it in 2010, that revolution certainly hasn't come yet. Wearable technology, remember when Google Glass was the near-term digital future? Remember when uh, Apple Watches were going to change everything? Some of you probably have an Apple Watch on right now. You're using it to count steps and monitor heartbeats. That's most of what we use them for. Uh, also, so that when someone texts you, it you know, bubbles on your wrist and you check the text. Um, the Oculus Rift is supposed to be the, the next wave of uh, virtual reality that's gonna change everything. It was acquired in 2013, reported on in 2014. We're still waiting. Bitcoin, it's been a decade now where Bitcoin was the next brewing revolution. Um, so throughout all of this, what I want to point to, I'm not suggesting to you that all of those revolutions aren't going to come to pass, but the pace of it, the pace from being reported on in a, a place like Wired Magazine as the revolution that's soon to come. When they were reporting on that in the 90s and the early 2000s, Two or three years later, you could see it happening. They reported on Wi-Fi in 2003. 
By 2005, Wi-Fi was everywhere and it was changing things. 3D printing isn't everywhere, it's not changing things yet. So what I would pose to you is that the pace of the digital revolution is slowing down. And in particular, whereas in 2012, the internet of 2012 was dominated by companies like Facebook that in 2007 were just starting and were not iconic parts of the internet. From 2012 to today, the major firms that dominate the internet have been pretty stable, partially because they keep on acquiring things like WhatsApp, Instagram. They acquire the patents that would allow for competition with them. And as those firms have stabilized, I would suggest to you, particularly in this format, that that allows for some different regulatory responses than came before. In the internet of the 1990s, the, the cyber libertarian trend then was to say, you need to be very careful with any regulation of the internet because it is still evolving, it is still changing. And who are you as regulators to even understand what's at stake here and what's gonna come next? I think they had a, a, a pretty good point there actually, that if the internet of 2001 is gonna be dramatically different than the internet of 1997, we need to operate with real care in trying to figure out in 1997 what the regulatory framework should be. I would say that one thing that, pro that we can probably derive from the slowdown of online innovation is that regulators here in Australia and in Europe and in the United States can now take a harder look at these firms that have stabilized and the usage patterns that have stabilized amongst them and think about user data rights. We can think about uh, antitrust and, and monopoly practices. We can think about these firms as stable firms in a way that we have other information industries, but for 20 years or so, we have thought we couldn't with the internet. Um, I think it also matters uh, directly for politics, particularly electoral politics, because again, as I mentioned at the beginning, in 2008, campaigns in the United States started using YouTube and they had never used it before. They had sort of a first mover advantage. There was an awful lot of value in tinkering around and figuring out what might work. And then since every four years we had an election where some other technologies were the iconic technologies, the challenge for campaigns was constantly trying to figure out how do you use this new thing. Part of what happened in 2016 is that Facebook being stable for so long meant that the campaigns had learned how to use Facebook and outside actors had also figured out if everyone is on Facebook, let's figure out how to manipulate people where they are. So as these sites stabilize, instead of a first mover advantage, we then get the, the trolls, the manipulators coming in and saying, how do we subvert this? Now that we understand the rules, now we can subvert the rules. So again, in digital politics, I think this slowdown is part of how we've seen the rise of this ambivalent internet or the, the earnestness assumption going away and causing such problems for us. So to summarize, the pace of digital innovation has led to continuous change in the role of the internet in political and civic life. If nothing else, what I learned from my trip through the history of Wired Magazine is that the predictions that we had for the, how the internet was about to change politics and society, some of them are proved right, some of them proved wrong, some of them are repeated throughout the years. But what's very clear is that the internet itself kept on changing, and so its role in society changed as well. That trajectory is not great. Again, looking back to Kevin Kelly's bet, in the mid-1990s, we were pretty convinced that the internet was going to bring forth abundance and if not utopia, at least something, at least better days. Now, we're at least not so sure and that's in fact re reflected in Wired Magazine itself, which has turned far more uh, tech critical, as have we all. We need to treat claims, I think, about the direct impacts of propaganda particularly in high information elections where there's so much other communication going on with caution, because that is a trend every year we see these stories of the digital wizards with no real evidence bearing it out. We're gonna see it again and I think we should treat that with caution. But I think we need to be concerned about the lateral impacts that this propaganda and disinformation can have both in terms of media agenda setting and in terms of the dissolution of these important load bearing uh, political norms. Um, we can no longer assume all political participation is in earnest, and that's a puzzle that both the tech platforms and we as society are going to be struggling with, I think, for quite some time. And as the internet, internet time slows down, regulation becomes feasible and necessary in a way that it wasn't before. Again, this is all food for thought. These are a lot of observations. So with that, I would love to take your questions. Thank you.
So I suspect there will be quite a few questions. And we have mics in the middle of the room. So if you, yes, just come to the microphones. I just had a quick question about the underlying idea of individual agency. It seems to flip Sorry, the underlying idea, idea of, what? of individual agency. Okay. It seems to flip and flop a bit. So sometimes people are there, just empty vessels, waiting to be told what to think. Other times they're very active and proactive and mm -hmm. using their agency to bring about certain things. And it seems to turn on what people want the theory to say or <laughs> what they want to interpret from something. Could you just have a bit more of a talk about that? Yeah. Um, so I think. There are multiple layers of analysis there is, I think, the key dif distant, uh, uh, distinction. In my previous books, I've talked about the organizational layer of, uh, I focus on American politics, of American politics. And the distinction there is, in mass politics, when you're talking about the entire polity, um, we assume relatively little interest and relatively little agency. Uh, that's a, a, usually a pretty fair assumption, because what's going on there is, at least in the United States, but I think probably in Australia as well, most of the public, most of the time, is not paying attention to politics. And if they're not paying attention, then we can assume that these campaigns, or the, these uh, actors who, are, who, have, who we're giving agency to, can put, forward, put forth messages that, if they are heard, will then have an impact, because people go from not paying any attention to paying little attention. At the organizational layer, which in the United States is maybe one to three percent of the public that engages in politics outside of elections, that are engaging in social movements, that are contacting Congress. At that layer, we then give agency to individual citizens because that subset of the population has made the choice or has been taught that they have agency to affect politics. And so they're engaging and we can study the work that they do uh, through social movements, through organizations. Um, and then, of course, we also give agency to political elites since they are there voting and, and enacting their, their uh, preferences through society. So that is, I think, the reason it goes back and forth is because if we're talking about mass behavior, particularly outside of elections, we don't give a lot of agency to the public because the public, we assume, is busy focusing on other things. Uh, and that means that they can be manipulated. Um, and then in the spaces where they are engaging, we then give agency to them. Just related to that, how does that affect the actors in bad faith? Are mm -hmm. they the earnest? Mm -hmm. or, or I, I'm just a bit curious about how they fit into that. Yeah, so I, I, I could have spoken more on this, but I was worried about time. What, what we've seen, that there is a long internet trend of uh, a subculture of people who engage in trolling and bad faith arguments. Um, they're concentrated in sites like 4chan uh, in the past decade, but it also goes back, and it goes back to 1980 that this sort of behavior was occurring. But they were concentrated in a subculture that did not care about politics. What happened roughly in 2014 is that that subculture started paying attention to politics, and then political actors paid attention to them. Uh, so in Gamergate, they were pressuring female gaming journalists, and then they were uh, attacking any news organization that gave positive coverage to those journalists or critical coverage to the Gamergate community. Um, and they had bad faith arguments where they would reach out to the advertisers of any uh, uh, um, news organization that covered it in a way that they didn't like and pretend that they were deeply offended by what had just occurred and convince those advertisers. And the, uh, Gawker, an, an online site, uh, they estimated that they lost seven figures of revenue from this Gamergate uh, advertiser boycott, which was an entirely bad faith. And the way that that ends up mattering in particular is that or, uh, political actors noticed all of that and said, this would be very useful if we can get that network of uh, trolls and, and miscreants to start enacting, the, enacting their power within politics. And they built those bridges, and then we've seen fruit come from those bridges over years. Um, so, they are part of the engaged public. They're engaging in politics, uh, and therefore we, we would sort of give them agency because they're doing things outside of elections. Um, and also it's then problematized because, again, if you were studying local politics, uh, like I, I always imagine local politics, people showing up to town hall hearings. Um, I was a political organizer before I went into academia. Some of the people who show up at town hall hearings say some wildly unexpected things, um, but they are earnest in their beliefs and committed enough that they're showing up. And so we give them, we afford them agency and we see that as a democratic good where we then say, well, if they believe such odd things, let's 
help them with their political information, but it's great that they're participating. And that, that is the assumption that we then need to relax or problematize when the people who are showing up are showing up with a strategic agenda and hiding that in order to uh, weaken broader democratic institutions. Um, we have a question in the gallery and then we'll come to you, Shani. Sure. Okay. Oh, thanks. Um, recently I saw the film Vice, mm -hmm. which is about Dick Cheney and, and the presidency. And the opening scene is all these images flashing back and forth, which talk about many of the things you're talking about mm -hmm. and also the click, click activism where people don't really take the effort to cross-check what they're passing on. Mm -hmm. But it also then brings in the element of legalising marijuana mm -hmm. across America. And when I was there in November, I was kind of a bit alarmed about how many people were smoking pot and just, just becoming disenfranchised from political debate and discussion, just wanting to mellow out. Do you think that, the le and last week they legalised it in Illinois, mm -hmm. um, do you think that's going to have any impact going forward for legalising mm -hmm. of marijuana and, and political discourse and cross-checking of facts and figures? That's interesting. Um, so I have actually read marijuana legalization in the opposite direction. Marijuana legalization is one of the cases that stood out for me um, as an example of how powerful the internet can be for social movements, uh, both that and gay rights. Um, and the thing that those two have in common is that if you look back 25 years, um, you have sort of a closet phenomenon where many people were smoking pot in the 1990s, but since it was illegal, uh, though it, I mean, there's plenty of cultural celebration of it, that made it difficult for them to organize because you can't bring together a set of pot smokers uh, and say, hey, here we are smoking pot, now let's organize resistance to change the laws. That's difficult because they're engaging in illicit behavior. Uh, and in the, same, in the same way, in the 1990s, being gay in America meant existing in the closet, which made it more difficult to form a community of interest that could then try to enact an agenda for your political rights. The internet was a force multiplier, I think, for both of those movements in helping those communities of interest find each other online, articulate their concerns, and then uh, wage campaigns in order to change the political reality. Um, I hadn't thought about what legalization of marijuana would do in terms of getting people to, to tune out and chill out. Um, a few years ago, I was looking at virtual reality gaming and thinking that that could be a, a similar threat, that if gaming gets really good while well, politics get, gets really depressing, we might have a generation of people who tune out by engaging in virtual reality gaming. That hasn't really happened because virtual reality gaming seems like isn't all that good after all. Um, <laughs> I would need to look at a lot more data to be convinced though because what I'm not sure of is whether the legalization of marijuana has actually increased the amount that Americans smoke pot. Um, it was pretty normalized before it was just also criminalized. Now it's decriminalized, but I, I'm not sure that's actually led to more pot smoking. It's just led to more pot smoking out in the open. I now smell it on the street too. I don't really like the smell, but I smelled it on the street if you were on the wrong street before too. So I, I would have to look, to look at data to be convinced on that, that latter point, I think. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Last question, I think. Um, thank you for a fascinating presentation. In relation to digital politics, one of the things that makes Australia, unlike the US and a lot of other countries, is that we have compulsory voting here. Right. And it, it works in the sense that, you know, 90%, 95% plus people are turning up and voting and voting validly. Mm -hmm. I know it's probably not within the scope of your research. I was just wondering whether you had any thoughts in terms of, it seems a lot of the international sort of use of digital politics is around provoking people to actually get active or at least to vote. Mm -hmm. In Australia, where you're looking at most of the adults who are looking at Facebook or social media or using the net are going to vote anyway, right. what impact might that have on, on the use of digital politics and its impact here, if any? Or mm -hmm. is that something maybe we need to do more sort of research on in this country? Could it be different? Yeah, so there has been some good research on this. My colleague Ariadne Vroman, who I think has given one of these talks, has done excellent research in this area. Um, there's two dynamics that I would, I would highlight for you. One is, uh, I think it's always important when we're thinking about comparative electoral systems to keep in mind that not only is the US a two-party system, which has some dynamics, and not only does it not have comp compulsory voting, but US elections are multi-billion dollar, multi-year affairs. Um, one of the reasons why I'm convinced that digital propaganda doesn't have that big of an impact in the United States is that it is within a broader sea of campaign communications. And when you add a, a trickle of additional uh, disinformation, to that massive flood of television ads and digital ads, 
it, it, it is drowned out a bit. The, the comparative, uh, the, the added value there is pretty small. Um, and in the, the rest of the world, all the world's other democracies have shorter and less expensive elections. I was visiting, the last time I was in Australia was in May 2016, and it was, it, it, it was adorable. I was visiting a, an uh, advocacy group called GetUp, uh, and they had on their wall a countdown clock. It was, I think, 39 days until the next election, because the election had just been announced. And they were preparing for this grueling 39-day campaign. <laughs> You know, the campaign had already been going on for a year in the United States. It had, what, another uh, six months to go. We are already preparing for the U.S. election in November 2020, and it is June, uh, June and July 2019. Um, and it's not just the length of the election, but also the amount that is spent in it, I think, matters a lot and makes the U.S. exceptional to the rest of the world. Um, I think that exceptionalism, the, the trade-off there is, while you have compulsory voting, since you have shorter elections uh, and less spent on electoral campaigns, that means that any incremental campaign effort is going to have a larger impact because it isn't within that sea of other communications. Um, and also, being in a multi-party system, you know, the United States has two parties and people are pretty well decided which party they vote for. Democrat, Republican, or independent, but an independent who always votes Democrat, always votes Republican. Um, so in that, we're pretty calcified on persuasion and what matters is turnout. Here in a multi-party system with compulsory voting, I would expect that the focus, the real value, is in convincing people to switch from one party to one, another relatively similar party, or if they don't have strong party preferences, switch to another one entirely. So you can see pretty powerful persuasion effects, I would think, here, because less money is spent, there's less overall communications, and the, the options, the persuasive options are, are much wider. Oh, can we sneak one more in? Yes, of, of course. <laughs> Ask quick and I'll answer quick. Thank you very much. Uh, a wonderful, uh, very thought-provoking lecture. Um, it strikes me that the perspective of it is obviously US-based, mm -hmm. the magazine-based, mm -hmm. but the internet and politics over the last 25 years surely has become more global and more strategic. What are the implications of the changes on a strategic international basis. And I'm thinking particularly of China's use right. and control of the internet yeah. and the possibility that China might overtake the USA in innovation. Right. Mm. Um, so China and GDPR are, I think, the two big things to flag there. I think it's, so one thing I would note is if we look back to the internet of the 1990s, well, the study is very US-based. I think that's appropriate because so much of the money and innovation is centered in Silicon Valley that while the internet is global and, it, and ends up being different in different parts of the world, an awful lot of the innovation is being fueled by a set of not just US but West Coast of the US based individuals. And they are sort of in the 90s enacting that agenda around the world. The, the, they are sort of digitally colonizing in a sense. Um, you're absolutely right that that's different now and in particular the competition uh, and sort of the trade-offs between the big firms that dominate the US internet and the big firms that uh, dominate Chinese internet. Um, and I almost have to end there because that, you've identified a very important puzzle that some people are doing excellent scholarship uh, studying and I'm not one of those people. That, that's a topic that I'm reading about and starting to think about. I think you're absolutely right that we should all be wondering what it means that we now have these two competing internets with different priorities. And my God, the social credit system in China terrifies me personally. Um, so there's a lot for us to think about there. Um, I'm not one of the people who's done productive thinking, so I can't say more about what we should make of it yet. Thank you very much. I'm glad we snuck that one in. I think you can hear from the questions how much thought you've provoked. And, and thank you very much for the questions. They were great. But join me in thanking Dr. Carl. Thanks.